Well, um, I'm here today with Jamie Fitzgerald, Polk County Auditor. How long have you been auditor? Since 2007. Okay, so so a decade. Yep. You know, now with marriage, after <laughs> a decade, people kind of get the itch and think about getting out. Where where are you uh, in terms of uh, doing this job, and um, how long do you think you'll be here? Well, I'll be here as long as the voters keep electing me. Okay. Uh, the the job changes quite a bit whether it's election law, some of the taxation rules. So it's always something new. Every year it's, it's a new, new twist on things. As you know, we have a new voter ID law coming into effect uh, beginning in 2018, but really taking effect after 2019. That, that law, law so it takes a lot of time to prepare for this kind of thing. So every day is a new challenge. Okay. Now, let's talk about um, you for a minute. We want to talk about the job of the auditor, and we want to talk about some election issues, but give us give us some background and insights into who, who Jamie Fitzgerald is. Well, I'm actually from Fort Dodge originally. Uh, I've lived in Des Moines since 1995 and raised my family here. My daughters went to Carlisle. Uh, now they're one's graduated college and one's at Grandview. So and a lot of, I've been involved in politics my whole life. My dad ran for governor in the 70s. Also in the 80s, ran for Congress in the 80s. So I've really been connected. Yeah. Now, ran for governor here in the state? Correct. Well, we know governor for life kept winning, so <laughs> <laughs> I have something in common with your dad. Well, he ran against Bob Ray. So okay. Yeah, yeah. That was the original governor just, for life. Just as bad. <laughs> yeah. So um, now, we really focus a lot on good, positive news. And um, we're going to talk about elections and, and your job, but tell us one of the reasons why you um, like being part of this community. Well, I love being part of the Polk County area. Um, there's no strangers in town. It's a small enough town that everybody knows everybody. And you're able to help, whether it's the Polk County Hunger Free Initiative, which is going very strongly, making sure that a lot of our folks are eating. Uh, for being a, a very affluent area, we have a lot of folks that aren't, aren't participating in food. Uh, we have a lot of groups doing the same thing, but not in the same areas where it's needed. So that's one of the things that we've, we've really been working on here as a county. So it's nice to be able to make a difference in somebody's life. Even if it's a small difference, it's nice for us. Mm -hmm. Well, and, you know, I was just talking to someone about this the other day. The county really does do a magnificent job in terms of human services. You know, so that's um, that's something that I think is important because the need is here. Correct. What is the job of the auditor? Well, the auditor has five main functions. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of sub functions, but the first thing we do is we staff where the administration for the board of supervisors. We take all where the the secretary for the board. So anytime there's three board members, they're going to talk about anything remotely close to being county related. Either my or my staff have to be there. Uh, you've seen us at the board meetings. We sit up front, and we're, we're the ones that are taking the notes. We keep all the files on hand. So any contract in Polk County, we, we have that in our files. The second part is we do a ge geographic information so system. So you change a parcel, you, the lines move. Uh, our goal is to make sure that university in Des Moines, the same as university, lines up to university in West Des Moines. Uh, for our for our emergency services, so you don't want you know an emergency group to have it, you know have it go here and then a mile up to the next one. So we, we coordinate that. Uh, we also have a taxing function where we make sure that uh, everyone pays their fair share and only their fair share. So the budgets come to us and we make sure we apportion. And you're talking about property taxes. Property taxes, right? Because yes. that's that's the main tax here. And Correct. That's okay. that's the main thing we get. Um, then we have a central accounting department where we pay all the bills. Um, so you, you do your invoices to the department, we pay the bills, and they're approved by the Board of Supervisors. We write the checks on Tuesday, you get the check on Friday. Um, and then finally, uh, we have all the elections. Mm -hmm. uh, we have over 275,000 registered voters, uh, active registered voters in Polk County, which makes us the biggest in Iowa. And we have 300,000 total, that includes active and inactives. Inactive people are somebody that has moved, that hasn't updated the registration, where we send them a voter card or send them a message and it bounced back. So they're inactive. So that, that's kind of, the, in a nutshell, we have 49 employees, a budget of about $5 million. Okay. Now, 
you know, you, you were elected as a Democrat and you are a Democrat, but that's right. a conversation for another day. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I represent everybody. I mean, oh, we, no, exactly. We, uh, sure. The thing is, we want to make sure everything's fair, open, honest. I think we've done a great job of that. Uh, kind of shirt-tailing off other county auditors uh, prior to me. We just made, made it open, and I mean, as a candidate, I, I hope you felt the same way, that you know, everything's on the up and up. Uh, we do satellites. We try to get to the communities. We go to a lot of meetings, and we're going to have our hands full trying to explain the, the changes because we're doing a soft rollout for this voter ID under the law. So in 17, you don't, you're going to be asked. You don't have to have it. In 18, you're going to be asked if you don't have your driver's license or the card that the Secretary of State sends you or a veteran's ID card, then you can sign a piece of paper saying, I am John Narcisse, and vote. In 2019, you're going to have to have either the ID card, the veteran's card, uh, or your driver's license to be able to vote. So, so, so talk to us about, about this law, because a lot of people aren't aware of it. Um, so, you know, talk to us about what this, this, this law means and what areas does it affect. I mean, we've been a show up and register the same day state. Will we still be? I mean, sure. what, what is yep. this law? So let's start kind of with the what you're going to see on the ballot that's different. So you're no longer going to be able to vote for straight party. So if you wanted to vote straight party Republican or straight party Democrat or Libertarian, uh, you'll no longer be allowed to do that. You're going to have to go through each, each individual office if you want to vote for that office and make a decision based on that. The second part is the early voting. So right now, currently we had a 40-day window to vote, which was late September. And now it's a 29-day window. So we're going to vote 29 days for the election. And then we're going to stop mailing ballots as county auditors 10 days before the election. So that's a pretty tight window to get your absentee ballot requested, about two weeks. And we're very concerned that people aren't going to know those rules. Uh, for just our numbers alone, in Polk County, 10,000 people asked for a ballot in the last week. So we need to find a way to make sure those folks understand that the window's closing in 2018, and we we got to make sure that if you're going to vote early, you need to plan a little little, little bit better than you have in the past. Uh, the, the difference between the 29 days and 40 days is about 20,000 completed ballots in Polk County. A lot of those are folks that come in to vote early. Uh, the first wave of absentees are always the biggest wave that you get back in the first week. And there's no longer you requesting a ballot at like caucus and signing up for a ballot to be sent to you in June. You have 120 days now prior to the election. So if you send something in for like the, let's say the primary in 2018, we have to send it back to you because it's not, not time to actually, uh, under the law, to request one. Then when you talk about voter ID, there's a soft rollout. You'll be asked, like I said, in 17, uh, you'll be asked. Uh, if you don't have it, that's okay. It's similar to what we do now. In 2018, you'll be asked again. If you have it, you'll be able to vote right on the machine like everyone else. If you don't have it, you'll fill out an oath of that this is who I am, and then you'll, you'll go ahead and vote on the machine like everyone else. And then 2019 is when the real change, you're going to have to have your driver's license, a military ID, or a, uh, the voter card the Secretary of State sends you. Mm -hmm. Same-day registration is still going to be available, but you're going to have to have something that connects you to that address within the last 45 days for the election. So like a lease, a phone bill. So we're still working through the rules with the Secretary of State, but they're going to try to make it so you're at least accessible. Every person will be able to vote. You'll be able to vote a provisional ballot, and then it goes to the special precinct board, and they'll, they'll make a decision based on your qualifications, whether you are who you say you are, and the information has been provided. Uh, one of the changes you're going to have are they're requiring e-poll books. So these are like computers where you go in, um, or you'll have to vote provisional if you make changes on election day. So you move from one, you move from West Des Moines to Des Moines, and you didn't change your registration ahead of time, you're going to vote a provisional ballot uh, if you don't have an e-poll book. And right now, currently, Polk County doesn't have enough e-poll books to implement. So in 2018, we may not have these. So there'll be a lot of provisional ballots. Now, who changes, uh, question, who changes voter, voter records or aligns voter records? Like, um, you know, I recently renewed my license, and when I went to vote in the school board election, because I vote even though, you know, my particular person was unchallenged, um, still vote, my registration site had changed. 
Now the poll workers called there because they've seen me vote there forever and they got it got to change. But it was just changed. So does that happen at the Secretary of State level? Does it happen at the county auditor level? Everything happens at the county level. Okay. The statewide systems is administered by the Secretary of State, but all 99 county auditors are in charge of their own county and their own voters. Uh, polling sites do change. On average, we, we get kicked out of about 10 to 15 polling sites per year, which doesn't sound like a lot when there's 177. But 10 to 15 each year, that's 40 a year. I mean, it wasn't that I voted in a different place. It's that they changed where I was supposed to vote. we got to correct it, but, you know. So they change your polling location? Yeah. Yeah, sometimes we have to change in an old one to now a new one and vice versa. It's, it's pretty hard to get into a lot of these areas. Uh, you have to be ADA compliant. You have to make sure. No, no, that's not what I meant. I, I still voted at First Christian Church. Okay. I voted there several times. I still got to vote there. Okay. They, my, my, um, I went from being part of precinct, I think it was 43 or 44, to I think precinct 63. So, and you hadn't moved? No. I'll have to look into that. Yeah, well, I mean, we got it fixed, so. Uh, I still need to look into it. So, um, in terms of um, voter education and voter, voter outreach, um, voting is such an important thing. Um, some people don't believe that. I am always amazed that after every election cycle, I get inundated with people who are upset about the outcome or impact of elections, regardless of the ideological slant, you know. Um, it happened after Obama, it happened after Trump, it happened after Branstead, it happened after school board elections, and they didn't vote. So how do we get across to people that voting really does make a difference and it matters? Well, you can always go to the situation where the one vote changed something. The one vote, you know, the old Kennedy, one vote per precinct in Chicago or two votes would have changed the, the course of history. Uh, you can look no further than Polk County. I mean, we've had tie votes. We've had one and two votes. We've had recounts. We want to make sure that, and our goal is to make sure everyone votes. Well, however you vote. In city elections, we're talking about you know a six percent turnout. In school elections, we finally got to five. Presidential elections, about eighty to eighty-five percent. And the gubernatorials, which we're going to see in two thousand eighteen, are about sixty to sixty-five percent. I would actually argue that the city and schools can have more to do with your daily life than anything else. Whether you're talking your property tax bill, you're talking about education. As a former school board member, you, you understand that there's a lot of things that the school board can do that affects every, everyday life for everyone. To ex explain to, for people to vote, we hear a lot of my vote won't count anyway. Uh, they don't count absentees. Well, that's a defeatist attitude. And we think that having everyone vote, no matter how they vote or who they vote for, is the best thing. That's why we go into the satellite sites, into areas where... Historically, voting is not not done well. We make sure we're in the suburbs. We make sure your polling site's close. Uh, it's not always going to be the closest area, but we want to make sure that early voting is available to you. So there's really no reason not to vote. Hmm. Now, did they do anything with the satellite or early voting um, satellite laws? No, the, okay. the, there's still 100 signatures. Uh, the only difference is we can't do them before 29 days out. Okay. The, um, you know, when you mentioned the impact on 20,000 votes, um, potentially, I think about the, the Gore-Bush race in Iowa that was decided by, I think, less than 5,000 votes statewide. Um, you know, at the county level, I think about the Joe Grandin at Jack Bishop race, which was decided by like a dozen votes. Mm -hmm. I remember telling Joe, 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 you need to be in our paper. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, Joe didn't listen. I'm I'm pretty sure Joe would have picked up at least 13 votes if he'd just. It's like it's like signing your name on the SAT. You get at least 400 <laughs> votes. You know, you, um, I think about the Frank County Mark McCormick race. Mark McCormick raised like you know half a billion dollars and, and you know and kind of wrote off that constituency. Frank reached out, won the the primary by like 30 some votes, less than three dozen votes. So. Rob Barone, Joe Jungle Ward. The you know one of them was going to get to decide um, how half a billion dollars a year gets spent, impact the future of our entire community through education. The other one would lose. 
fewer than three dozen votes. So um, there, there's so much history of really, really close elections. And I think in West Des Moines, we even had one that was decided by a school board race by one or two votes. Correct. Right? So how do we get folks to see that? What, what mechanism needs to exist? Because in, a, in our society, this is how we this is how we hire and fire people. This is how we, you know, not necessarily hire judges, but this is how we retain or fire them. This is how we hire somebody who, you know, makes a decision at the Secretary of State law to prosecute like Matt Schultz did or to, you know, reach out like Chet Colbert did. I mean, so how do we really, I mean, what mechanism do we need to create? We, we've talked about the importance of it, but what should a mechanism look like, whether it's grassroots or governmental or the schools, to really get across that this is how you matter in the society? And as harsh as it, it sounds, when you don't vote, you don't get counted. I mean, that's just that's that's a reality. It's harsh. It's brutal. You know. I mean, there's there's a there's a reason why certain things happen in the suburbs and certain things don't happen in the inner city. And sometimes it's directly and proportionally linked to the participation in the political process. So, how do we how do we create that mechanism to get people to the polls and get people engaged in the in the political process? Well, there's two different areas of voting. There's the nonpartisan, which is cities and schools, which is extremely hard to get people to vote. City schools, ballot initiatives, judges. You don't have the party infrastructure that helps you either side. Right. You just there. Nobody's knocking on your door, other than a few candidates. And really, the only way they knock on your door is if you vote, because their time's limited. And to have a five percent turnout for the, the Des Moines school district, that was actually an upgrade. But it's hard for these candidates to go out and focus on people that don't vote. So a lot of the candidates in the last school election expanded their list. We had requests to get people that voted in the primary, people that voted in the general, but not the school election. And you saw a little uptick in the turnout. When the parties are involved, whether it's Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, Green, Iowa, Iowa Party, you have people that are willing to go to the doors for you. You have a lot of people on the ground wanting to know what your opinion is. When you're voting, voting for school and city, those people just aren't there because it's nonpartisan. That, it should be nonpartisan. But you just don't have the ability to go out and do a mail plan. You know, it's going to cost you a couple hundred thousand dollars. You just don't have that when you vote, when you run for city and school. So a lot of it is going to the community centers and trying to get people at least engaged. Uh, we do a lot of speeches, whether it's neighborhood groups, the neighborhood associations, or the senior centers to try to get people at least engaged in talking about elections. Uh, our office doesn't take a pro or con side for anything, Democrat, Republican, but we want to make sure that we get out there and get the message out there's an election coming up. The election for the city elections is November 7th. And you know, last time was about 6.5% in the city of Des Moines. Uh, four years ago, it was about 12 and a half. And a lot of that's based on which, which ward seats are up. But we think it's going to be a better turnout this time. And it's also the last time cities are going to be by themselves. In 2019, city and school elections are together. So there, you'll go to the ballot box, and if you live in the city, you're going to vote for your, both your city council and your school board members. So that's a change that's coming up in the near future. Now, the, um, and that, that will be very interesting to see how that works. One of the great ironies for, for us as a publication is that part of what has made us impactful is the very thing we're trying to end, which is low voter participation. I mean, um, in a gubernatorial election where, you know, a million and a half people vote, we have left it less influence than, say, a school board election where 2,000 people vote and it's going to be decided by 50 votes or less. Um, with, with that said, um, what can be done from a media perspective, what can be done by radio stations, what can be done by local TV, what can be done by newspapers to, to con contribute 
And, and I ask that because we see in, in a number of areas, you know, I mean, we get the ads from the Ag Council. Like one of them that we're running has this cute little kid and he's holding a juice box and it says sugar bites and the little juice box has a little monster. And, um, you know, uh, there used to be the commercials out of Pueblo, California. And then there was the one where you had the Native American riding across and tear. Remember that? And it's like clean up litter. So the, the media has over the years played an important role in, in, in educating people. What can we do from your perspective to increase education about the importance of participating in the process and voting? Well, I think covering the elections. I mean, it's very few times you actually read or hear in the media that there's an election coming. Uh, a couple days before the election, I'm sure there'll, there'll be some you know, ads or some from the candidates or maybe an article or two. But for people that are low turnout folks, preparation is the key. If you're not writing about it until the day before, the couple days before, a lot of these folks will just be turned off. So getting information out, uh, and that's what we plan on doing for the voter ID, is trying to do a, some kind of a media program to let people know what they're going to face. Because what we don't want, uh, you go to the polling site and have to vote an official ballot and not understand why. So that's on our office to do that. It's on the Secretary of State's office to help with that. But in terms of following elections, uh, we're just seeing less and less of it. Uh, you know, you, you talk to more national media now than you do local media for the presidential elections. Uh, I, you know, we had a lot of national media attention and limited local media. And that's either through Sweeps Week or something else, but you know, for whatever reason, we don't see a lot of articles like we did 20, 30 years ago about every candidate. Well, that's one of the things we're excited about. We actually have sent out a questionnaire to candidates. You know, typically we send out the questionnaire after they get through being traumatized by it. <laughs> Some of them send it in. For the city of Des Moines, it was a little more traumatizing, most likely because it asks about 25 really hard questions in addition to getting background. For the suburban candidates, it's a little easier. They only have 20 questions to answer, but they're all open in. There aren't yes, no questions. So, and, he, and people can go to our Facebook page and they can read it or they can see it in our special edition of the paper. So, well, we, we've covered a lot. Is there, you know, what is there anything we've missed? Is there anything we should have talked about we haven't talked about? Well, you're always able to vote in the auditor's office. Uh, our office is open from 8 to 5, Monday through Friday. So, if you've made a decision voting for uh, city council, Please come down to our office. You can always request an absentee ballot, and we'll send you send you a ballot, postage paid. You send it back, uh, but you're running out of time, so we, we ask you to get out there and vote. Polls are open November seventh <coughs> from seven a.m. to eight p.m. and results will be on our website. If you have any concerns or questions, uh, go to our website, hopecountyiowa.gov backslash auditor. Well, you know one thing, and I've you know when I've talked to candidates, I've said you know if. If um, the state of Iowa could find a billion dollars for Oriscom, shouldn't they be able to find money for this? And, you know, um, I'll say this. If voters can find their way to, you know, a Prairie Meadows, or they can find their way to, you know, a movie theater, or you can find your way to a grocery store in some or several communities. Like in the inner city, you got a hundred grocery store. It's much easier to find a place to vote. Because it's in your neighborhood. Correct. Uh, one of the proposals we, we plan on pushing into the 2018 legislative cycle is if we're going to be forced to have these computers and to check everybody with computers, that we go to vote centers. You know, you may you may live in Des Moines, but you might work in Altoona. If we're going to use technology, let's use it. And a lot of our places have, we're in the same location. If you drive down Grand Avenue during a general election, there are 10 to 15 polling sites. Why not just have a couple there and let you go wherever you want to go? If we can make it as easy as possible, let's do that. So that's a, the proposal we'll be pushing again this year. We've been doing it for about a decade. Uh, we think we have a chance this year. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank I appreciate you. it. It's great.